Francis before meetings, uh, but who uh, it is not widely known, but I was able to confirm, took a, Francis a Franciscan habit himself uh, in 1972, uh, and uh, very quietly, uh, in a way that he never, never, never talked about, but did become a, a Franciscan friar of the Holy Name province. Uh, at one point near his death, he said that what he wanted most was to be buried in a Franciscan habit. Uh, and uh, one of his aides told me that he said to him, well, that would raise some eyebrows. Uh, but that turned out not to be the way that was going to go. But we want to sort of be thinking about these things. I also want to say that I've just, uh, I, I took a, a speaking engagement right before this, just two days ago. I told Father Patrick I was uh, on, a, on an online discussion uh, about an hour ago talking about the new encyclical uh, and talking indeed uh, about uh, those ways in which um, if we are followers of Francis's uh, call to fraternity, and you can wonder about which Francis I mean when I say that, uh, but if we are followers of that call to fraternity, then certainly we're called to live in the world in a particular way. Uh, and I'm happy to say I've had a chance to read the encyclical and I am delighted by it. Uh, in some ways I can see the rest of my career uh, spelled out in its pages because there's a lot there to digest about how we live our faith in public spaces. Pope Francis is very, very much concerned about how we live as public witnesses. Uh, there's a lot to talk about there and maybe we'll get an opportunity to, maybe we'll do it another time. But let me dive right in because I wanna thank you for the softball question you've all asked me here uh, to uh, answer for you tonight because I can dispense with it quickly. Uh, that question, if I've got it right, is can it be a sin to vote for a particular candidate? No. Good night. Uh, it can never be a sin to vote for a particular candidate. Never, not any case, very simple. But rather than just walk out of this room and into my hallway and into the rest of my home and leave you all here disappointed, let me try to make it more complicated. Voting is an action. It's an activity. It's a thing we do. And like almost everything else we do, it's an action that has moral content. And this gets us, I think, a little nearer the question that I'm really being asked here. How do we make judgments about this moral action we call voting? And the answer has to be that like every other action we undertake that has moral content, we have to be very careful about our intentions. In other words, rather than simply saying no in reply to this question, let me respond more fulsomely to this question I'm being asked in this way. Voting for candidate A or for candidate B never can be a sin on its own because our reasons for doing what we are doing determine the action's moral content. Let's spend some time with that way of thinking. Let me pose a not really hypothetical hypothetical. I can't tell you the names of the people who might be described by the case I'm about to describe. I only can say that I am sure there must be hundreds or thousands of people who fit the description. I wanna ask a question about the Nixon administration's illegal bombing campaign against Cambodia in 1969 and 1970. I think you're all too young to remember that and in fact, so am I. But we do have the advantage of history and we can read and we can think about it. So let's imagine a Catholic voter in 1968 who voted for Richard Nixon because Nixon had promised to bring peace with honor in Vietnam, a war at that time claiming thousands of American and Vietnamese lives that had dragged on for years. I'm bringing up the Cambodian bombing campaign because several episodes of intense, and I wanna underscore again, illegal, carpet bombing across 15 months launched by Nixon against a nation with whom we were not at war caused thousands of innocent civilian deaths. Estimates vary and there's no way really to be sure how many were killed, but one bombed area during that campaign of about 25 square kilometers had over 20,000 bombs dropped on it to give you a sense of scale. The city of St. Louis, by contrast, is 171 square kilometers, seven times as large as that area. And you can imagine if 20,000 bombs had been dropped on the city of St. Louis. 
The language of moral theology tells us that material cooperation in evil doesn't require us to intend the evil act to occur. But if we provide assistance or support that makes the evil act possible, we might be guilty. I'm not gonna get too technical about the moral theology just yet, but it's enough for now to emphasize that the driver of a getaway car after a bank robbery who didn't rob the bank is still guilty of the robbery, even if he says over and over, I don't really think that bank should have been robbed while driving the robbers and the money away from the bank. And what I wanna illustrate here is how, the how high the stakes become once we embark on a certain sort of moral thinking about voting. It's a question raised by our topic this evening. Is our hypothetical Catholic voter a helpless moral passenger in the getaway car of Richard Nixon's immoral act simply because she or he voted for Nixon? We especially would wanna remember that Nixon's defense for bombing Cambodia was somewhat paradoxically that he had done it to force the North Vietnamese to the negotiating table. He had bombed Cambodia to bring peace just as he'd promised. And the very thing our voter went looking for when she or he voted for Nixon. Let's make it even worse. St. Augustine lived in the fourth and fifth centuries. He was a Christian writer and bishop around the time the Roman empire was falling. And he had a tough job because a lot of Romans had decided that Christianity's peaceful turn the other cheek way of doing things had softened the empire, made it weak. I think we're good? We're good. Did you hear Augustine? What's the last thing you heard? Uh, Augustine. Oh. So, so say, oh. say what Augustine, talk about Augustine. You said yeah. made it weak and then you went flat. I felt it. All the energy went out of me. Like Donald Trump had given me a nickname. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so, uh, all right. So Christianity's peaceful turn the other cheek way of doing things had softened the empire, had made it weak. And so Christians were to blame for all the empire's troubles. Being a committed Christian and a loyal Roman, Augustine set about to the difficult task of demonstrating why Christianity wasn't responsible for Rome's troubles in his lengthy book, The City of God. To make his case, Augustine had to describe why Christianity could make its home in the world and support a state or a city or an empire. He described circumstances in which lying could be justified to achieve another good. But even more interestingly, he made a similar case for violence, killing, and war. The just wars tradition in Christianity began with Augustine, and it should make us pause that the Christian saint and doctor of the church said more or less what Richard Nixon would say 15 centuries later. Augustine wrote, all wars are waged with peace as their objective. My point is that we have to be very clear about what politics is and what we should expect from politics when we ask a question about the moral content of my action as a voter. No one who ever held public office in any time or context I can think of was not responsible for bloody death or for decisions that made someone poor or hungry or vulnerable in some other way. Politics can be a dirty, difficult business. And those who govern never keep their hands fully clean because they can't. That was what Augustine meant. Times will come when bad things need to be done for a greater good. Doing the bad thing is never a good thing. No war becomes a good thing because it brought peace. But we can justify our decision to turn to violence depending on our intentions. If we are seeking some good that couldn't be obtained any other way. In the real world where we live, being presented with a better set of options than that is actually quite rare. Most of the political choices we face ask us to choose the least worst option among all the imperfect alternatives. Pope Francis said this well in 2013 when he told an interviewer 
politics is the most important of the civil activities and has its own field of action, which is not that of religion. I'm suggesting that politics, and so voting, demands something different from what religion and moral theology demand from us. Our political action, like all action, has moral content. But we can't weigh the morality of our actions without looking at the actions themselves. When our actions are political, then we have to look closely at what politics is before we can understand how we should apply moral principles. I'm saying, in other words, that political life isn't a philosophy classroom or a textbook in moral theology. We learn from a textbook and we study in class about the moral principles that we have to value but the application of those principles out in the real world where our choices never are ideal must be concrete and adaptive. We can't deal in abstractions or simple binaries, not even such important binaries as good and evil or innocent and sinful. Life is more complicated than that. Let's spend a little time thinking concretely about the moral action of voting. One of the first things I'll ask you to think about is how new the question we're asking is in the Christian experience and about how new it is to Christian experience because it's new to human experience. I said earlier that voting is an action like any other and like any action it has moral content. We need to judge our actions in the light of what moral purpose motivates them, what outcome we're trying to achieve. That's true. But it also is true that the language of moral theology quickly becomes a little cumbersome when we talk about this new activity. This way that every registered voter, every teacher, plumber, priest, and Walmart greeter has a say in what direction their government will take. Prior to just a few centuries ago, it was both the case that ordinary people played no role in governing, and it was the case that ordinary people had no advantages of education or even literacy that would help them understand the actions of their governments. We live in a very different and a very new way today. And that can be easy to forget when we're thinking about moral questions in the way that the church has thought about moral questions for centuries since before these tremendous transformations took place in our politics and our lives. Think back on that example I gave earlier about our imaginary Nixon voter. What the church actually teaches is that voting is a form of remote material cooperation. Material cooperation refers to any sort of assistance given in the performance of an action. Think of our getaway driver, assisting by keeping the car running and driving away from the bank. When we say the material cooperation is remote, we're referring to some distance from the act itself. President Nixon bombed Cambodia, not our poor voter. In the case of remote material cooperation, the cooperator, our voter, doesn't participate in the intention of the actor President Nixon. And the cooperation doesn't help President Nixon unless our poor Catholic voter knows what Nixon will do. In this sense, the voter can be excused if the voter didn't know what Nixon was going to do or if the voter didn't assist Nixon in any way. But these questions aren't all that easy to sort out. Remember, Nixon campaigned for peace. Later, he said he bombed Cambodia to achieve peace. And 1,500 years earlier, Augustine had said, all wars are waged with peace as their objective. Was our voter naive not to think of what a president of the United States might do to achieve peace if Augustine had known it centuries earlier? How much knowledge do we need to have about what a political leader will do months or years after we cast our votes in a world whose circumstances can change quickly to find that we are responsible because we cast a vote? Must we spend a politician's whole term of office with a white knuckle grip on our phones or remote controls wondering what evil act we accidentally supported months or years earlier? 
Let me make it even worse still. The assistance that's provided by an act of material cooperation is the vote that puts a political leader in a position of authority to commit an immoral act. Without some number of votes necessary to elect him, Richard Nixon could never order anyone to be bombed by the US military. But which votes were the ones that put him over the threshold to win? Whose votes were they? And which votes were surplus votes that he didn't need because he already had crossed the threshold of victory? Then again, do the votes we cast even matter? If the president or vice president should die between now and December 18th, when the Electoral College will vote for president and vice president, those electors simply can vote for whomever their party names as a new candidate for vice president or president. That's because we voters, despite the great responsibilities of our citizenship, don't vote for presidents and vice presidents. We vote for those electors. So when a president commits an immoral act, is it our remote material cooperation or the electors remote material cooperation? I'm suggesting that these are some important problems that moral theologians need to grapple with in the light of how a political system like ours really works, which is totally different from the political systems of the Middle Ages or the ancient world. We Catholics spend a lot of time worrying in anticipation of our voting about whether we can vote for the candidate who supports abortion laws or not. But we spend, in my observation, very, very little time, retrospectively, looking in the rearview mirror, asking ourselves how responsible we are for the consequences of what we did know or what we should have known when we voted in the past. But mostly, that's a set of problems for people like me to work through. How should the church be dealing with these questions in very new political systems in light of our very old Catholic framework of moral analysis? The question you've really asked me here to answer is whether it would be a sin for you to vote for Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And you know my answer. It's not a sin to vote for either of them but there are sinful reasons why you might vote for either one of them. And that's what I want to encourage you to be thinking about as we head down toward election day 2020 and as you continue your lives as Catholics and American citizens. There are two things here that are really important. One is about that problem of naivete, the problem of what you should know when you vote. You really have a moral responsibility to be informed and thoughtful. Frankly, I think it's a much greater responsibility to be informed and thoughtful than it is to vote in any particular way, because without thoughtfulness and knowledge, you can't really know the moral content of your vote. That means you have to know something about the candidates and their positions, but much, much more critically, you also have to know a lot about how the American political system actually works. Let me just make this observation. If you think that abortion is a critically important moral issue, then you and I have that in common. But abortion has been US law since 1973. There have been 11 presidential elections since then. This will be the 12th. If 11 presidential elections have not made a difference, why do we think a 12th will? Could it be that there are technical and structural reasons why our votes in presidential elections have not made a difference and never will make a difference? Speaking as a political scientist, I happen to know that the answer is yes. And as a Catholic voter, you have a grave responsibility to know something about that too, about the political system. The reason is because no matter how important abortion is, there are other issues. You have a responsibility to be thinking about those issues and you have an even greater responsibility to weigh them all against each other in the light of what's possible and what's not possible. That last part's really important. Sometimes I think we look at voting like a symbolic act, like waving a sign at a football game, or maybe more like painting our faces and our chests. But politics isn't a football game, and voting is nothing like cheering. A real world lurks beyond the election and it's filled with real people who will be helped or hurt, who will live or die. No matter whom you support with your vote, 
I think your voting must be a sin if you are not making some sort of good faith ongoing effort to understand the system you're voting to influence. Otherwise, I think it's a bit too much like saying you're a heart surgeon and you intend to save lives, but you slept through your anatomy class. The moral content of our action depends on knowing what our action is. And that means more than understanding that access to health care is good and abortion is bad. It means understanding what our voting means for those things. But then we come to the more straightforward question of what the candidates promise to do. And there we do want to take note of the church's moral teachings as we choose our priorities. But the fact of our politics, which has its own field of action, which is not that of religion, as Pope Francis has told us, the fact of our politics is that we will never find the candidate who perfectly suits the Catholic moral position. It's never happened. It never will. To conclude then, you can't vote, you can't sin by voting for a particular candidate. But certainly I think we do sin if our vote fails to take note of the difficult moral challenge the Catholic faith sets in front of us and if that vote was not cast with some honest and realistic knowledge about how voting for the candidate you choose for the reasons you had will actually and effectively achieve the outcome you're hoping for. Our moral action as voters must have the right intention and we cannot just vote for something right in the abstract without thinking about what actually can happen. Being right in politics and ineffective is just like being wrong in politics. In both cases, innocent people suffer when their suffering might have been prevented. That's the outcome we have to labor to prevent. And failing to prevent it, I think, is the only way we can sin by voting. And that concludes the formal presentation. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I will, if you have your, th that was excellent, Steve. You, if I could um, ask a question before we get started. Uh, is it also true then, you're, you're saying that we have a moral obligation to, to form our conscience, basically, and something that is very clearly stated in the, in the catechism. So does that, does it follow then when we're not, and maybe that's what you're saying at the end, if, you, if we don't exercise any sort of, of reasonable searching and, and, and investigating of the candidates and their positions, we are in fact not meeting our obligations and would we be sinning? I think that's one half of what I'm saying that we have to be informed about the candidates and their positions. But the reality is that the candidates will tell us just about anything to get us excited and vote for them. So what we also have to have some capacity to do is peel the label back a little bit and understand whether what they're telling us has any relationship to what's possible in the political system. That's why I made the analogy to sleeping through anatomy class. You know, the reality is, you know, I, I spent 15 years teaching the introduction to American government to undergraduates. They didn't want to be there. Uh, it was my job to get them excited by, you know, pointing things out like this, even though they weren't Catholics, pointing out that any kind of political effectiveness you really can hope to have has to begin with understanding what people who want your vote won't tell you, that it's actually really complicated. Uh, that things change really quickly. Uh, and, you know, when we get down to the question, you know, the, the question we always wind up with about abortion, there are legal reasons, uh, both why abortion hasn't changed, and there are legal reasons today why voting on abortion in a federal election actually is wasting your vote. I could talk about either of those. But you have to have a certain understanding that begins in a good American government class and continues in ongoing education for citizenship, not about candidate positions, but about the process of government, what happens in government, what government does, so that you can understand what the real choices are, not just the abstractions of campaign platforms. 
Good, thank you. I just want to add, as a political science major, I very much enjoyed my Poli Sci 105 class and very much wanted to be there. So, anybody have a question for Steve? Um, I have a question. I wanted to follow up on the last thing that you said. How, if um, you know, when when someone is voting. Um, Republican, right? So the Catholics that are voting Republican because of the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more, it'd be great to understand a little bit more about how to respond when they say, or what, what you just said, that when you vote um, for on this pro-life issue in a federal election, that it doesn't actually make any difference. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I feel like I'm not, I don't have a response for them um, when they, um, you know, when they tell me that voting for Biden would be a sin and so on. So I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more about that or in more detail. Well, there's two tracks I can take on this. One is I can deal with the question of voting for Biden being a sin. Hopefully I've just done that for 20 or 30 yes, minutes. Yes, you have, um, yeah, yeah, you explained, yeah. The legal question, you know, this is one of the hardest things, is uh, the third branch of government is a mystery to most Americans. Uh, I, I have a PhD in political science, it's kind of a mystery to me, and even a lot of lawyers that I know. Uh, the intricacies of the legal system uh, elude most of us. That's why we depend on good reporters, good reporting, good journalism. And that's why I'm underscoring the importance of reading that and following that to understand that. There has been a line of cases since Roe versus Wade. And uh, even the most, actually the most recent case that was decided in June, June Medical v. Russo, uh, is uh, affirmed something that the court decided in 2016 uh, and affirmed it in a way that I'm arguing uh, the work is done from the pro-life perspective at the federal level. And the reason is because what the court did was it did what it has done since 1992. The, the Roe decision, had, the Roe precedent has been affirmed more times than any other precedent, I think, in constitutional law. What John Roberts has said, what Sam Alito has said, what Brett Kavanaugh has said, what Neil Gorsuch has said, and what Amy Coney Barrett said under oath, testifying for her position to be a judge of the Seventh Circuit, is that Roe is the law of the land. It is settled law. It's a settled precedent. It can't be disturbed. But what the court said in June in the June medical decision is that doesn't matter. Because now, if pro-life activism is what's motivating you most as a voter, if abortion is what's motivating you most as a voter, then what the court has done it has, is it has moved the, the argument down to the state level. The states now have an expanded power to restrict access to abortion. That's what the cases are about, but the restrictions are really taking place at the state level. The state level is the most important. By the way, most Americans wander through life, I think, not really knowing these implications of federalism. Uh, the sorts of things that Father Patrick learned in a Good Politics 105 class, right? That, you know, the states are actually where most of the action is. Roe took the question away from the states in 1973. The question is probably about 85 to 90 percent back there now. That's not widely appreciated. But I can tell you the most pro-life justices I can think of are never voting to overturn Roe. They know there's a better way, and it's at the state level right now. There's one other thing I want to say about that, too. 41 percent of the, I'll call them abortions, they are abortions in a moral sense, but I'm not sure they are in a medical sense. 41 percent of the abortions in the United States are medically induced. Mifepristone, right, the abortion pill. And that is on a really fast upward trajectory. We are very near a time where the whole argument about abortion is no longer going to be about clinics or procedures. It's going to be about access to that pharmaceutical. And while I'm not a bioethicist, I do want to say I think that raises a different set of bioethical issues. Not a different set of moral issues, but it raises a different set of bioethical issues. And if we want to be really serious about this issue, then that's what we have to be keeping our eye on. Uh, in other words, you know, the, the occult purpose of everything I have said here today is most of what you are hearing about this is a shiny distraction that is intended to get you to vote in the way that people have voted in 11 presidential elections for the same reason, as though nothing has changed. And a lot has actually changed, but Roe hasn't. 
And so I think one of the things we want to do is step back and learn from this. And one of the things, the most important thing we need to learn from this is that the actions we want government to produce can only be produced by the government that can act in the way that it can act under law. And if we want those things, it's not just a matter of rah, 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 my team every two years or every four years. It's a matter of actually understanding what government can do so I know what that vote I'm casting means in a moral sense. Thank you, that was really helpful. Thank you, yeah. Any other comments or questions? I have a, I have a question. Um, I apologize, it's a little ill in, ill-formed at the moment, but I think I'll get there. The last thing you said raised the question of what government can do. And that question seems to be a, a relevant one for many of my family and friends on all sides of issues. Um, with the most conservative Catholics I know holding the line that government should do very little. So I, I'm a U.S. historian, so I sort of ha I have tracked sort of the, the movement of, of parties and politics and the role of religion. Um, and, and I wonder what your take is on that from a moral theological perspective, because it, I, I see it as a very, um, that has been a process of history to construct an understanding that, um, about government and its role in our politics. And I wonder how you come at this from, from your perspective and how we might talk to people about what government's role is in other critical Catholic social issues. What a great day to ask me that question. First, <laughs> first of all, uh, I'm not a moral theologian. I'm not even a theologian. I'm a political theorist. Uh, as a, a, a member of a theological faculty, I'm a fraud. Uh, I always want to say that in public. Uh, very important to appreciate you're dealing with a fraud. Okay, uh, I'll take it. But I also want to say, uh, and this is, this is really great, the, the answer is in Fratelli Tutti. The answer is in Pope Francis's new encyclical today. Uh, because uh, Pope Francis has said um, the most direct things about this that any pope has said well since Benedict who said the most direct things about this that any pope had said well since John Paul II. Um, Benedict, excuse me, Francis is very focused on the danger that a certain kind of economic liberalism poses because it promotes a kind of individualism that is the enemy of human fraternity. Um, and, and in fact, he has a passage, I'm not gonna, uh, it's barely in here because I've had the document in my head for barely 36 hours. But he has a passage in there where he says that the right to private property, and, and so this is the bulwark, for example, that you know, classical liberalism says protects us from the power of government. This is bedrock American conservatism. Private property, Francis says, has been recognized by the church since Leo XIII, but it's a secondary right. And it's been elevated by many to the status of a primary right, but it's still a secondary right. We have a right to enjoy private property because of the universal de destination of goods. That is to say, all of creation exists for the good of all human beings. We have a moral claim to use property, not to hoard it. Mm -hmm. And the underlying fact there is, and I liked the way uh, uh, this panel I was on an hour or so ago, I think it was Tony Arnett uh, from uh, The Economist says this, and he is an economist. Um, but, but he said, you know, it's, um, it's this way in which uh, conservatives and traditionalists have been told that this idea of economic liberalism is conservative or traditional. And what Francis is saying, it's not. It's a lie that was invented and called traditional. It was called conservative to promote a particular kind of an agenda. Now, the real answer to your question, though, is what's the church really calling us to then? If it's not to that, what's the church really calling us to? And I don't know that Francis has that really worked out yet. I, I've been working on it a lot, and I don't have it worked out yet either. But I will say 
Um, Solicitudo Regi Socialis is worth looking at on this as well. John Paul II's encyclical on, um, on Solidarity, 1987, on the uh, 20th anniversary of Paul VI's Popolorum Progressio, which is also worth looking at on this. John Paul says in Solicitudo Regi Socialis, almost word for word, what Francis says. And in fact, the way he says it is so striking that we are posed with a choice between an underdevelopment in some parts of the world that is immoral and a superdevelopment that is equally inadmissible. And what he's talking about is privilege. Mm -hmm. What he's talking about is privilege. And what he is saying is that if we are going to live in solidarity with one another, or as Francis is saying today, if we're going to live in human fraternity with one another, that's where our attention belongs because it promotes this selfishness and it promotes this hardness of the heart that says, you can't have what I have. You must be wrong because I am right. It promotes division. It promotes polarization. So I, I would, you know, what I always, in, to conclude a, sh a long answer to the question, uh, you know, what I always like to do in a conversation like the one that you're talking about is, is I, I always like to pose people with the question, who's the real conservative here? Uh, because what I'm saying comes directly out of scholasticism. It comes directly out of neo, uh, neo, uh, um, neotomism. Uh, this is the teaching of the church going back to the gospel, going back to the first century, going back to the Acts of the Apostles, and they held all things in common. Uh, the universal destination of goods is the beginning of Catholic social teaching. Uh, and so if that's not what really is traditional, well, I, friends, I just don't know what is. Uh, I'm the real conservative here. Thank you. Good question, Laura. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Uh, uh, Steve, what else might you tell us about having read the encyclical? Um, I'm sure, I don't know if anybody else has, I have not, but. I, I read it really, really fast. <laughs> um, and and uh, Christopher Lamb was uh, on this panel. He's a, a Vatican correspondent for the tablet. And, and he said too, that it's been a very difficult document to report on because there is so much in it. It, it is a very full 70 or so pages, uh, very full. Uh, Francis has definitively slammed the door on reversing uh, the change of the catechism uh, concerning capital punishment. Uh, and he's done it in the best possible way. Again, very much like I, what I was just saying, building it on the tradition and how the tradition has always thought about it. Um, Francis, I think, uh, sets a couple of very important challenges in front of us. And I think they are challenges that are meant to confound both the left and the right. Um, not just in the United States, but globally. He begins the encyclical um, with a really good analysis of the dual challenges in front of us. One is a, is, um, a distortion of populism, and the other is a distortion of liberalism. Um, one that is distorting uh, what should be done in the name of the people into what is only done in the name of the few who want to manipulate the people for their own advantage. Uh, and the other is a distortion of a system of government that is meant to be for the people. Uh, and yet again, uh, is a driver of uh, the inequality of wealth and the inequality of power, both in our societies and all around the world as well. So he's got his eye on the whole spectrum. Um, and I think also too, he's got two or three paragraphs that I really want to spend some more time with uh, on the historical consciousness. Uh, it's a not as unusual a topic for a pope to write about as you might think. John Paul had a book about it, Memory and Identity. Uh, this way that we um, are social creatures who are receivers of history. And much of what he has his eye on in a document that's about human fraternity is about our own desire to dominate one another, to dominate culture, to dominate history. And that has a lot of different expressions. He talks about... Um, a, um, a way that um, a certain point of view, and I think he means to challenge uh, a lot of folks who are coming out of the perspective of structural critique about this, uh, but, but there's a way of saying, uh, among some people, he says that we can begin from zero, that we can wipe history away and start over. 
Uh, and that's not possible because we are receivers of history, good and bad, sinful and just. Um, uh, I'm seeing a, a chat comment come up here. I'll come back to it in a second. Uh, that we are receivers of a history that we have to receive whole. And toward the end of uh, chapter five, uh, which is a chapter all about um, the political community, uh, he talks about uh, what a huge mistake we make in politics when we focus on results instead of fruitfulness. And what he means is that we have this tendency to want to do a big thing. We want to achieve an outcome. We want to end racism. We want to end abortion. We want to do whatever the big thing is. What Francis seems to say is that that usually means rejecting some history. It usually means rejecting the people who disagree with us. And it never seems to work. And that what he really says is that we have to value, we have to give greater value to the fruitfulness of good deeds. That we have to value the attractiveness of doing small good deeds, uh, that the value that that can have in our social life. And he goes on and he says, you know, there is no good deed that goes unnoticed by our creator. Uh, and we also have to proceed with the kind of hope uh, in the goodness of the seeds that we sow, that over time, those seeds grow into something and become fruitful. That it's not for us to wipe the chalkboard clean and start over. We can't do that. But what we can do is proceed in hope with small actions aiming toward fruitfulness rather than big actions trying to win something and obtain a result. Um, so I, I think it's a wonderful document. I, I said to somebody earlier today that I see the rest of my career in its pages, um, which is both exciting in one sense and in another sense must mean I'm getting near the end. Uh, so here I see uh, Jennifer has a question up in the chat. I think I heard you say Augustine would, in a sense, approve a bad action done with reference to a good intention. Wouldn't Aquinas say that's not true? No, that's not quite, that's not quite what I said. Uh, I talked about justification, um, which is what we talk about morally. Um, but having a justification doesn't make a bad thing a good thing. Uh, that's consequentialism. Uh, that's not what we do. But we, we can justify doing a bad thing when it's the only way to achieve a good thing. Justification doesn't make it good. It doesn't, you know, put a blessing over it and take the badness out of it. Uh, that's that double effect stuff that you're getting at, I think, with St. Thomas, that we, we have to hold on to the badness, to the sinfulness of it. But, you know, the point Augustine, I think, would make is certainly the point I'd make, is that we very rarely get the choice in political life between the good thing and the bad thing. Certainly not in this election, certainly not in anyone I've ever voted in. Um, all of political life is uh, holding our noses and doing the least damage we can find a way to do. Uh, and what I'm trying to communicate most today is that the most important thing for that is understanding how the system of government really works. We spend so much time thinking about moral theology, we forget we have to think about political science. We have to think about history and sociology and law because all of those things really determine what the moral content is. The moral principles uh, only tell us, what, uh, tell us about an abstraction when we talk about politics, unless we get into the concrete reality of how politics works. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Steve. Any other thoughts or questions? I, just picking up on that theme that you mentioned of intent versus impact, um, and then and then just as, as you mentioned from an intent perspective, uh, you know the, the the responsibility to be well informed, and I'm just curious, you know, your thoughts just in the context of um, you know politics and decision making today, as opposed to maybe what has been historically and people's ability to be well informed um, or to be um, misinformed um, and, and, and to potentially have, you know, good intent, but um, to, to, to not understand uh, what that, you know, what, what the impact would be or, or potentially to be so desensitized to who may be impacted that, mm -hmm you know, that, 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 it, that it doesn't weigh on that decision. So I'm just curious your, your thoughts about that. Yeah. 
uh, again, uh, it's such a full document, Fratelli Tutti, that mm -hmm. everything we're going to talk about, I can point to a paragraph in it and say, yep, Francis said that. Uh, and what he said today, he's got a long section on digital communications and on uh, okay. our consumption of media. Okay. And what he says is it's ironic that we, we have access to more information than anyone in human history ever had before, but it's content without wisdom. Yes. It's information, actually, what he says is it's information without wisdom. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a really helpful framework. Uh, yeah, they're <laughs> party poppers tell us. Um, we, the information is easy. We have to be the bringers of the wisdom. And, and this is what Francis says too. You know, you, we, we have this remarkable capacity to communicate with one another today. But real communication, real human encounter can't happen only digitally. It can happen partially digitally, but real human encounter means a real encounter with a person. Uh, and that means time. And that means commitment. I think the answer to your question is we have to do it in our communities. Mm -hmm. I, I, I uh, told my wife, you know, uh, we've been married a long time now, uh, and so she's accepted this, that I'm always on duty. Uh, I accepted this a long time ago. Um, you know, I, I once, we once signed a closing on a house. We spent 45 minutes signing our name while I argued with the lawyer and the real estate agents about the postal service mm -hmm. um, because they, were, they had bad information and they had bad opinions because they had bad information. Yeah. I think, I'm not trying to say, you know, that we argue for the purpose of being disagreeable. We have to have a regard for the person in front of us. But part of our regard for the person in front of us has to be an evangelizing desire to bring them the wisdom, to help them really see and understand. Uh, and I think, you know, that's a good way to think about what our parishes and our Catholic student centers should be doing. This really is supplementing education. This really is supplementing the consumption of journalism and all the other stuff that we do with that moral dimension of wisdom. Um, we have to become bringers of wisdom to the information that's everywhere out there. And it requires all of us to always be on duty, uh, even at Thanksgiving dinners, uh, which might not be such a problem this year, I suppose. But you know, it, 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 we really, we, we have gotten so much into our silos. We have gotten, we have decided that everything is so fraught and people are so angry that we've stopped talking to one another about the stuff that matters. And of course, that's only made it worse. We have to be patient with one another. We have to show some charity to the person in front of us, but we have to be the truth police. We have to be the wisdom police. Uh, and I mean this in the sense, by the way, of community patrol. I mean this in the sense of walking the beat, talking to everybody along the street, getting to know people, getting the feeling and the rhythm of the community, diffusing conflict before it happens, de-escalating situations, but also bringing a voice of justice and wisdom. Uh, that's what we're called to be in the public square. By the way, Francis said that too in Fratelli Tutti, right? That we have to be a public witness to all of these things. That's the role that we play. Um, we have a tremendous power today, a power that almost no human beings before us have ever had to really influence how the world looks and how the world works. And part of it's because we have all this information. But with that power comes a duty, a duty of citizenship and a duty of faith to discharge this call to community policing and to be always on duty, always on uh, all the time, uh, trying to be a voice of charity and justice uh, and trying to make this world a little bit better just with good deeds. Not trying to beat anybody, but I'm gonna correct that thing you just said because you were wrong. Uh, it's nothing against you. Here's what you need to go read. You need to think that about that a little bit more. Imagine how that would sound to someone else. That's always a good thing to say. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of letting stuff go. We owe it to each other too much to make the world better. And I think we have a capacity to do it, but it means being always on duty. Well, well said, Stephen. Great charge for all of us going forward in the next month. I think it's a, exactly a month from today that we will be voting. 
I want to thank you again, Steve, for being with us tonight. Steve's going to be with us again in two weeks as well. Uh, next week, we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kincaid. Uh, Dr. Kincaid has her PhD from uh, Notre Dame, and she uh, is also uh, a lawyer. She has her uh, law degree from the uh, University of Texas, and she is going to be uh, speaking on, does voting for a third party advance Catholic social teaching? So be with us again next week to hear Dr. Kincaid. And then as I said, Steve will be back the following week, uh, October 18th, and we'll be speaking on what role does the virtue of prudence play in helping us decide for whom we vote. Important topics as we prepare. Thank you all for being here again. Thank you, Steve, for being with us this night. Happy Feast of St. Francis. And we will say St. Francis of Assisi, pray for us. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.